Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. In January, glad you are here in the house of the Lord and online with us here. We're delighted to have everybody in God's presence today. You're in the church of those who are breaking the 21-day fast. Hallelujah. <laughs> we are excited about caffeine and sugar and all of those beautiful things that God has made for each and every one of us. Amen. <laughs> good, good. Sister Pam and I are very happy to be in a new day. Praise God. We're going to have a great time today in a lot of ways. I think our worship is going to be outstanding. Hopefully, if I do my job, the word will be good this morning. But above all, the goodness of the Lord is here. Amen. We're going to honor uh, Brother Ricky and Sister Kimberly today. It's their second anniversary and we are so grateful to be able to honor them today. If I forget to say it later, uh, and I didn't say this last week with Dr. Paul I here, you know that you can, anytime I have a guest speaker, you can designate anything you want towards them financially, uh, towards their ministry. The fact that I have them here says that I believe in what they're doing, and you're certainly encouraged to support them as well. We always give them a great honorarium and do that with grateful hearts. But at the same time, for those of our staff who are here on their anniversary, you know that even though we're not doing a pass-the-plate offering, we encourage you to do a love gift for them in a card or in the offering plate. You can do it electronically. You just designate. Okay. Hey, I forgot to ask Sister Pam if she would pray this morning, open us in prayer. So I'm going to ask her if she'll get ready and come and do that this morning. And you and I are going to enter into the goodness of God, right? We're going to enter into his presence today. I'm going to show you something in the Word. If you're reading along with us in your Bible that you should have read either on, um, if, you're, if you were ahead, I think you read it on the day of inauguration. If not, you read it the day after. And I don't know if you saw it or not, but we're going to see it together this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, Sister Pam. Good morning. Well, good morning, everybody. I've warned some of you that I had coffee today, so that means no caffeine in 21 days, and I'm ready to worship. Okay. Praise God. The Lord is with us, isn't he? The sun's shining. It's a beautiful day to just rejoice in who he is. Amen. Come on, let's pray together. Father, we love you today. We're so thankful. We're so thankful, Lord, that the sun is shining. And we're so thankful, Father, that you are in control of every situation of our life. And we have gathered in this house together to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to encourage ourselves in the Lord, to encourage one another in the Lord, to feel and to experience your presence, Father, because you are are a great God, and you will never forsake your own, Lord. We bless you in this house and ask God that you would touch each and every one, minister to hearts, minds, and spirits this morning, Lord. And most of all, God, may your spirit just blanket this very room. As we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, our hearts will be encouraged, Lord, and we will give all glory and praise to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Feels good. I, um, Started getting really warm there for a minute, and uh, that feels good alone, right? Sometimes I just want to come in here and build a fire somewhere, you know, like the old churches, have a big pot belly stove right in the middle. Well, today is our uh, two-year anniversary. I've kept my mask on because we're preparing to pray for Brother Ricky and Sister Kimberly. We are thankful for their ministry here among us. More than anything, we're thankful that they're a part of the family here, amen, part of the church. That's... That's really what brings us together week in and week out through the storms of life and the challenges is that we're family in the faith, right? And that's a good, good thing. 
So I'm going to ask Brother Ricky, Sister Kimberly, come and join us here, Sister Pam, and any of you who are, if we have any deacons in here in the 9 o'clock service and the other pastors, would you join me here? We have um, extra samples this morning. They're just sitting there, so I don't think we'll knock them down, but if, if we, any of us get carried away and hit those with our heel, you're going to hear a, a, a corruption here. But uh, we are thankful for all of our team here. We appreciate them so very much. And we also pray for them, right? Because it's prayer that uh, opens that door. Uh, your presence is an open door, we sang. And, and that's what we do when we worship and pray is we're, we're seeking his presence because we want an open door. Amen? And when we do that, we go in and we, we give God thanks. We give him praise. But we also pray for other folks, Right? and their needs and their situations. And so this morning, uh, as you pray for all of us every day, today we're going to focus our prayers on Brother Ricky and Sister Kimberly. Pastor Adam, would you come and lead us in prayer this morning? I thought I saw you come down here. The rest of you, would you lay your hands on this precious couple today? And let's, Would you, congregation, would you pray with us? If you want to stretch your hand this way, that would be beautiful. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this gorgeous day that you've blessed us with. Father, we take this moment today to celebrate Brother Ricky and Kimberly, Lord. And Father, we pause in, in your presence that's still in this house today from, Lord, them leading us in worship. Father, we thank you for your presence that's here. We thank you for this beautiful couple, Father, newly married, newly into ministry, Father. But we thank you and we know that there's a blessing upon their life. So, Father God, we just raise our hands towards heaven and raise our hands towards them and say, Father God, protect them. Lord, keep them. Lord, may there be an overwhelming joy within each of their hearts. Father, may there be an overwhelming enthusiasm of you. Father, may your spirit inside of them stir so strongly that it bursts outside of them as they enter into worship, not just in this house, but within their own home, within every place that they go throughout each and every day. Surround them, Lord Jesus, with your presence with your protection. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your favor that's already upon them. And pray a continual favor upon them, Father. Not only the favor of God, but the favor of man. So, Father, may they be blessed, an overwhelming of joy, enthusiasm, of happiness, Lord Jesus, and their lives overflowing, Lord Jesus, because of your spirit that's inside of them and doing an incredible work. Father, we give you the glory. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you so very much. I'm going to hug you even though we're in a pandemic. I don't think I'm too contagious. God bless you. Amen. Come on, let's give these guys a hand this morning. We, we appreciate them. Pastors and deacons, thank you so much for uh, praying with us. You know, we do that more than anything I bring everybody forward as a symbolic statement of support. We want uh, our team to know that the church is behind them, the leadership of the church and the membership of the church, and that's why we do that. So again, you have every opportunity to bless them. You can send them a card at any time, or you can drop a card or an offering there in the, in the box. And as the video said, as we opened up this morning, thank you for being so very faithful to the church, to the ministry here. And um, even though Sister Pam and I don't play the lottery, we um, don't believe in that, but uh, we'll certainly take the tithe from whichever you won that $730 million. Uh, <clears throat> you knew I'd have to say something about that, right? <laughs> uh, if ever was a group of people that needed prayer, it's that group, amen? Well, you'd find out you had cousins in Thailand and... India, and you'd have cousins in Central America. The only good thing is somebody won even more money a few nights later in, in Michigan. My sister lives in Michigan. I should call and see if it was her. Go to your, in your Bibles this morning to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. Praise God. Exodus chapter 12. And look at verse 42, please. If you don't understand the reading plan, there are paper copies available. I know in this foyer, both foyers, 
Pastor Pete, both, they're in both foyers. So you can take it on paper and just, it's a few chapters every day. But if you're doing it electronically on the app or the um, Bible app, um, you, you go and you find it. There's instructions somewhere. Pastor Pete will tell you where to find it. But um, you, you're reading through the Old Testament. And at some point this week, th- you should have read this. Verse 42, on this night, The Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him. I'm going to read that again. So this night belongs to the Lord. And it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. This night belongs to the Lord. I love that. This night. You know, biblically, Situationally, the Bible is referencing the night of Passover, the night when the children of Israel were preparing to come out of Egypt. Sometime after midnight, probably close to daybreak, they are exiting that nation. After many years of being there, some Bibles reference 430 years. We don't know exactly where that time begins, some think. And I don't mean that not all of them say 430, but some of the study Bibles, some of your commentaries will say that that timing began with Abraham coming into Canaan or some Isaac. But what we do know is they were in Egypt for several generations at the least. And on this night, God chose this night to bring them out. That's the historical context and you and I know it. But there's a prophetic context as well. When God declares this night belongs to me, he's declaring that for all of his people. Amen? He's declaring that for whosoever will step into the promise. This night of your cancer diagnosis, this night of your addiction, this night of your confusion about the culture and the society around you, this night belongs to the Lord. This night of your divorce, this night of your abandonment, this night belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to fight the battle. You don't have to do something or get anxious or worried. This night belongs to the Lord. It always will for his people, not for the Egyptians, not for those who are bringing the bondage, staying in the bondage, celebrating the bondage, but for those who want out, for those who are following the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, this night belongs to him. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. You were singing. Come on now. I could could hear you clear in the back. This night, your night. Pastor, I don't want to go through a night. You're going through a night. That's what happens to God's people. But the night belongs to him. Amen? All right, well, I'll try and show you what I mean. Why? Why does this night belong to the Lord? Well, it belongs to the Lord for a few reasons. Go to verse 1. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. When the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. That's a pretty big transformation there when we're just going to move the whole calendar ahead a few months. There's some importance here. Would you not agree? God's saying, listen, I I know you've been worshiping me and you've been kind of figuring out as you go, but I'm telling you, this is a new year for you. Now, they don't know what's about to happen yet. They have no idea of the cry that will spread through the land of Egypt, the deliverance that they will experience in a night. Possibly a million, million and a half people set free from their slavery in one night. But as that night, as that evening begins, God says this is a new day for you guys. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year announced to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Divide the animal according to the size of each family and how much they can eat. Don't you find it interesting that God had a way to unite the neighborhoods? Well, we need that today, don't we? God had a way that broke down every barrier. He broke down financial, economic, 
caste barriers. He broke down racial, skin color, or tone barriers. He broke down gender barriers between men and women, since that's the only genders there are. He broke those barriers and said, listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to prepare to eat a sacrificial meal, a sacrifice. You're going to make the sacrifice and then you're going to consume the sacrifice. For most of you, it's going to be too big for just your house. So I want you to reach across your fence, and I want you to be neighborly in your neighborhood. Because this is more important than anything else. Well, I don't know. Those people on the other side of the fence, they don't look like me. They came from a different nation. They talk a different language. Those people on the other side of the fence are weird, strange, odd. I don't think I like them. God said the animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. Number one, this night belongs to the Lord for you because you chose the sacrifice. You chose it. I love this. Some of you have heard me talk about before. This is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament that they were supposed to choose this lamb. had to be a year old had to be flawless, spotless. And listen, those who work with livestock, they know good livestock. They know what that means. I don't, but they do. You go to a livestock auction with a guy that's been around livestock all his life, or you go to a a horse auction with a gal that's rode horses all her life, and you're going to hear things about that livestock that you, you, if you don't work with them, you just don't know. You don't even see it, right? If it was me, I'd bid... $12 $12 million and just get some scrawny little thing, but they know. Remember Egypt. While they're in Egypt, they introduced themselves, Jacob and his sons introduced themselves as shepherds. This gang knows sheep. And so God says through Moses, you have to pick one, and then you bring it into your home, and you keep it there for four days so that you can inspect it and so that you can bind with it. And once your kids are bound to that sheep or goat, I want you on that fourth night to slaughter it there in your house. Not not at some special place, not certain appointed people, but all of you. In your home, you're going to make the sacrifice, as you and I know, when they get to the tabernacle and the temple later on, the priests handle all of this except Passover. Passover was to be done by the person, individually, the father of the home, of course. But they were all to be participants in it. You have to choose Jesus Christ. You have to want him. You have to have him close. And once you've chosen him, you have to take special care, not of him, but of your choice. Because if you let Satan come in, he'll rob you of your choice. He'll get your attention on something else. He'll direct you into love with some other thing, some other experience, some other Savior, some other person, some other possession, power. But they chose him. God said, listen, because you've chose him, this night belongs to me. This night. (laughs) Come on, you think we're not going to get there today, but you think about what he said when he said, this night belongs to me. When they got to the edge of the Red Sea, God was saying, don't worry, this night belongs to me. When they crossed over on dry land, God said, don't worry, this night belongs to me. When they turned and saw the Egyptian army led by Pharaoh coming after them on the same dry ground they just walked on, God was thundering in their souls, don't worry, this night belongs to me. When you chose that lamb and brought him into your house, when you took special care of him for four days, you named him and fell in love with him, You heard his heart beat. You felt everything about him, and then you slaughtered him because you made that choice. This night belongs to me. Hallelujah. Lots of times God's people get into the midst of the Red Sea, and the Egyptians are coming at them, and they forget this night belongs to the Lord. But when you choose him, when you choose the Lord Jesus Christ, when you begin right there, God says, this night belongs to me. You must have him close enough to 
to inspect his ways. Jesus said, what man goes to battle that hasn't first counted the cost? And If you're going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ successfully, you've got to know, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be challenging. It's not going to make you happier than you are as an unbeliever. It's not going to make you wealthier than you are as an unbeliever. It's not going to necessarily make you healthier. It's not going to make you more joyful. It's not going to make you more encouraged or anything like that. What it's going to make you is a child of God. And the child of God goes through the Red Sea occasionally with the Egyptians hot on their trail. The child of God sometimes faces things in the wilderness they never expected to face. They can go into places where there's no water. They can go over here and find there's no food. The child of God can go into situations that they absolutely didn't understand. Sometimes their own mouth can get them in trouble and vipers can come out and start biting. But God says, listen, you're my child and I have this night. I own this night. It belongs to me. So even when we get sideways with God, he'll bring us back. As long as we understand the choice that we made, we chose Jesus. We chose him. Now, I understand the Bible says he first chose us. I get that. God's the one that's instructing them on what to do. He's the one providing himself a lamb. But I want to tell you again, because you chose the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God owns this night. God is in this place today to remind you that he's got your back, that he's out in front of you taking care of what's ahead. He's behind you making sure the enemy doesn't overtake you. He's blessing your finances. He's come alongside to bring healing to your body, to deliver your soul. Jesus Christ was chosen in the midst of a battle. And because you made that choice, God says, I own the night. Hallelujah. Come on. I believe somebody's being delivered right now. Right now. If you'll trust Jesus Christ, he'll deliver you. You've got to inspect his ways. Take special care, God said. That's why Jesus in Revelation said to the church, you have left your first love. And I encourage you to come back. Come back to your first love. You've got to know my ways. You've got to keep me close. In that closeness, you're going to see things about me you never saw before. You're going to understand my name. Listen, you can say, well, they didn't name. The Bible doesn't say they named. No, I know, but I've got two kids. We've had our fair share of pets. We're left with a dog right now that belonged to our kids. Kids left, dog stayed. We're not happy campers. But we've had other dogs. Not one of them is known as dog. I know sometimes people call their dog, dog, just to be funny, but they always get a name. If you've got kids, your kid's name, it doesn't matter if it's a hamster, goldfish, it doesn't matter, stray duck, chicken, they don't, you can get it, they'll name it. You can find a groundhog and bring him into your house and raise up a raccoon. It doesn't have to just be a puppy dog. They'll name anything. You put them on a farm with 100 animals, they'll name all 100 of them. And in that name, they begin to assign personality traits. When this family or these families in the neighborhood got together on that particular night, as they brought that lamb into the midst of the gathering, I'm sure the children were just as exuberant as they had ever been, just as excited about having that lamb in with them and mixed into their daily lives. It's a late night. Things are a little odd on this night. We've stayed up late. We're dressed and ready to go. The men have their walking sticks in their hands, and it seems very strange for this hard-working, enslaved population to be up preparing to celebrate near midnight, but they are. But then all of a sudden, their dancing turns to death. And I've told you before, you can imagine the screams that take place throughout the Jewish community in that land of Goshen. The entire population grieved, gut-wrenched by what's happening and overwhelmed with the oppression that they feel. But this night belongs to God. Here's the second thing. Go to verse 21. 12, chapter 12 of Exodus, verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders in between what I'm reading is what I'm going to read. God speaks it to Moses, and that's all recorded. And then Moses speaks it to the people, and that's recorded. This part about the sacrifice and the blood is a little more detailed 
as Moses shares it with the people. So that's why we skip down, okay? I'm not trying to ignore the story, but I like this detail. Verse 21, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. Then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames, but not on the threshold, we would add. You're not going to step on or trample this blood. Put it on the top and sides of the door frames of your houses. No one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. I know that you're Jewish. That doesn't matter. I know they're Egyptians. That doesn't matter. If there's blood on the doorpost, I'm passing. If there's no blood, I don't care if it's the home of Moses. I'm not passing. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. This night belongs to the Lord. Why? Because number two, you trusted the blood. When you feel pressed in, when you feel an enemy rising up to try and steal from you, when you feel the oppression of Satan doing its best to wear you down and to get you to give up on God, to tell you that it's not worth following him, that your faith is in vain, you're not worthy to even go to church, when you feel all of that, you've got to be reminded this night belongs to the Lord because I've got the blood of Jesus in my life. I've got the blood. It doesn't matter how I grew up. doesn't matter where I came from. doesn't matter how much money I have, what my education is. None of that matters. I've got him in the night because I trusted the blood and nothing else. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It's that, and it's nothing else. Nothing. I, I read a um, Jewish commentary here, and um, I should have brought it out and actually showed it to you, and I can't remember exactly what it was. I, maybe I'll look it up. But... Um, it was a short commentary. It was a contemporary commentary. It was online. And uh, the rabbi writing was writing recently. This isn't a 200-year-old commentary. But I think it reflects a lot of the unbeliever attitude towards God. And this theologian said that in this context, what we find is that the people of Israel demonstrated the merit that caused them to be worthy of God's visitation. The merit, M-E-R-I-T. They demonstrated the merit. In this story, they demonstrated how worthy they were for God to do this. That's interesting because the rest of the Old Testament takes God through the course of their history as he's talking to them over and over you don't deserve anything. And I'm not saying that to belittle or ostracize or marginalize Jewish people. I'm saying that to belittle, ostracize, and marginalize humans. Because all of us try to create our own God. I saw somebody the other day, he was an atheist, he said, I, I am the only God I know. I thought, well, yeah, that's probably true. But if you want the Lord to own your night, You've got to trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. There aren't seven different ways. There aren't 12 ways. You have to know the blood of Jesus Christ. You have to be able in your darkness and sometimes your depression, your agony, in your grief, having lost a loved one, you've got to say this night is more oppressive than I ever thought a night could be. But God owns my night because I have the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't always feel it. I don't always understand it. And sometimes I just have to go back and remind God I have the blood of Jesus, but when I do, he reminds me, I own this night. Hallelujah. Now, faith has to be applied. Many believe that the hyssop branch represents faith. I tend to agree. But whether you see that or not really doesn't matter to me. You have to see the blood. And faith can be difficult for each of us to explain how we understand it. 
It's so objective, you must have faith. It's also very subjective. As James said, I'll show you my faith by my works. It's difficult, but you know faith when it's inside of you. You know faith when you're reaching out to God. You, many of you, I I just felt you, heard you singing this morning, and you were singing by faith. It wasn't just, oh, I see those words, hallelujah. You were singing as a connection to God. And I want to tell you this morning on the authority of his word, God was singing back to us, I own this night. No matter what you're going through, no matter how deep the grief is, I own this night. No matter how difficult your journey has been, God says to you, I own this night and I'll defend you in it. It takes something. It takes an activity, an action. It takes an engagement to activate or apply the blood. There is no doubt. You can't just take it and throw it. You're doing something to get it there. And God gave specific instructions. And if you remember, we see that again and again, even right up to the cross. When you and I think about the blood of Jesus, we're invited to come in to the journey of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, if knowing Jesus and having his blood doesn't make you happier or healthier, listen, I'm not saying it never does. I'm saying all of that can be here, it can go, it can show up, it can disappear. But Jesus will never disappear. And if when they spoke of stoning David, if he had to encourage himself on the Lord, I'm just here to tell you this morning, every saint, every child of God is going to go through things in which they have to say, I'm going to get up today and I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to remind myself that he owns my night. He doesn't say to me, fight through it on your own. He doesn't say to me, here, good luck with the enemy. I hope you can overcome Satan and his forces. He says, I own your night. Trust me and watch what I do. Now, it can take time. We have to go through this journey. We have to be bold and confident. We have to be patient. We have to bear up long and stay faithful. And in each house, we must apply the blood. The house of hardship, the house of grief, the house of illness, the house of persecution. I said Wednesday night how incredibly intimidating and overwhelming it was to me and probably to you as well. If you were here last week and saw Dr. Paul I as he shared with us what he faced in hardship and then even had pictures of what it looked like to be in the kind of prison that he spent time in and the people around him who did not make it and those nights, all of them together as a night. You hear him talk again and again about ten and a half years, cumulatively, several different times in prison and then out, and the whole time overseeing all of the Assemblies of God churches in Vietnam, and they were exploding in growth. To walk with him at times, to be in ministry with him, and I've done it many times, but I sat there again last week, just broken inside saying, I don't know, I'm so glad you didn't choose me to go through that night because I don't know if I would have made it. But in my night, you've given me everything I need to make it. I've got the one I chose. He's the sacrifice. I've got the blood and I'm applying it because I know that it's not about me. It's not about anything I did or how I feel. It's about him and what he did and how he feels. And the Bible says he ever lives to make intercession, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Amen. Hebrews is full of imagery that points back to Passover when Jesus Christ became our Passover lamb. We chose him, and we applied his blood. Glory to God. This news is good enough that you could share it with somebody else. Amen? Praise God. It's news that no other tongue can tell. It's news that no other book can share but the word of the living God. It's news that was planned before the first spark of creation. News that was planned in the midst of all the angels, but not for them. News was given to you and I by the King of Glory. 
Number one, you chose the sacrifice. Why does this night belong to the Lord? Because you chose the sacrifice. Oh, I know about the people of Israel, but I didn't live back then. I live now, and I know that prophetically this still applies to me. This is my promise as well, because all of Abraham's promises are available to me in Christ Jesus. Amen? And you know all of this is happening because of Abraham, right? God had him in the land there, Canaan's land. Before he died, God met with him several times and said, I'm going to give you this land. And even though the children of Israel got themselves down into Egypt and God used that time to provide for them, even though they were in Egypt and it was dark and a lot of hopelessness, God did take care of them. Let me say it again, America. Even in a time of governmental oppression and hopelessness, God took care of his people. You chose the sacrifice. And Abraham, you're blessed and I'm blessed. And this is one of the things that we have to realize. This is a foundation cornerstone. It is the cornerstone of our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ. It's everything and it's everything from beginning to end. It's everything for you and me. It's everything for the church around the world. There is no other way to the Father but through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's enough. Amen. This night belongs to him because you chose the sacrifice. And this night belongs to him because you trusted the blood. And in every house you live in throughout your life, chances are that you will not be a baby in one house and and 80 or 90 years later pass away, and that's the only house you've lived in. But whether or not you do geographically, physically, spiritually, emotionally, situationally, you're going to go through houses in your life. And in every house, you apply the blood. In the house of darkness and grief, in the house of sorrow and shame and embarrassment, in the house of addiction and brokenness and abuse, in every house you apply the blood. Thank God, I believe somebody's getting healed right now because the blood of Jesus Christ is healing. The blood of Jesus Christ is health. The blood of Jesus Christ breaks every sickness and affliction and disease. He takes it all because he became a curse for us. Amen. Glory to God. Here's the third and final thing this morning. Let's go back to where we started, and let's go to verse 40. The people of Israel had lived in Egypt for 430 years. In fact, it was on the last day of the 430th year that all the Lord's forces... (laughs) I love that translation. All the Lord's forces. Well, wait, wait, I thought... I thought the armies of the Lord of heaven were the angels. I I thought it was saints, only other people. Nope, nope. It doesn't matter how insignificant you feel among the people of God. You are the Lord's forces. Hallelujah. Well, what could he mean? You're the force of righteousness in this world. You're the force of good. You're the force of faith. There is no other faith but among the people of God. You're the force of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't act but among his people. He turns our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he makes sure that we're able to declare the day of the Lord now and always. We are the Lord's forces. Praise God. We need to live like it. On this night, verse 42, on this night, the Lord kept his promise to bring his people out of the land of Egypt. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated every year by all the Israelites from generation to generation. Number three today, Jesus. This night belongs to him because he will keep his promise. And we struggle with this. Nobody that I know Nobody that I've read or heard, nobody has ever told me, and believe me, they would have told me that if there's any other preacher or teacher who preaches about the return of Jesus Christ more than I do. Good job, Pastor. I love that. I've argued with people. I have a friend. He's, he's much, more, much a theologian, and uh, we get together. He's always saying, it's the resurrection. It's all about the resurrection. I said, nope, it's all about the return. Only the return. I can find, I've told you in preaching sometimes, I'll get us to the rapture. I don't care what book of the Bible we're in. I'll find the rapture there. 
I loved it last week. I was about ready to get up and just dance a little bit when Dr. Paul said, you know, I got off that boat and because the word of the Lord came to me and said, do not be a Jonah, get off this boat and go back. And he said, I had gotten on that boat because prophecies, I had had many prophecies and one of them said, you will go to America and the nations and you will be an apostle to prepare the church. What did he say? For my rapture. And I was like, hallelujah, Dr. Paul got us there too. Praise God. I've heard him criticize it and condemn it. I've heard him say it's just a modern figment of the church's imagination. It's escapist theology. It's this, that, and the other. But I'm hanging on to the promise, the spirit and the bride at the end of the book, the end of the whole thing, after battles, after raising the dead and feeding the multitudes, after all of that, the spirit and the bride say, even so, come Lord Jesus, hallelujah. That's good enough for the Holy Ghost. It's good enough for me. I'm sticking with it, amen? Paul said everyone who has this hope in them, Oh, John, everyone who has this hope in them purifies himself even as he is pure. doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but when he appears, we're going to be like him. Amen? Paul said, the dead in Christ rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds. He said, comfort one another with these words. Because in the darkness, it's hard to be comforted, friend. As your screams are going up because of what you're going through, the agony of what you're witnessing, enduring, suffering, what you're having happen to you. In the midst of all of that, the Holy Ghost will tune your hearing in to what's happening to the Egyptians, to what God's doing to the enemy. You and I get so intimidated by this world, overwhelmed by what we see happening around us, that we forget every day that the darkness intensifies. It's because Satan knows he's got that much less time to stay out of the eternal lake of fire. He's fighting for every breath he's got because his night is getting shorter. God owns the night, my friend. He will return. Jesus Christ will never break a promise, not one. He said, I will come back for you, and where I am, there you may be also. He won't break that promise. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's why he owns the night, because he keeps promises. Glory to God. Thank God. I feel good. I'm ready to have pizza. Praise God. So I preachers get in trouble. The anointing gets you so close to you. You got your flesh and the anointing and they're just operating inside. But you get, the anointing helps you get excited. But once that anointing's gone, you're just still excited. And you're like, what can I do? What can I do? Throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. I only had half a cup of coffee because it was making me sick. But I feel it. I feel the Lord. You know, the other day when I read this, um, I think it was Thursday morning for me. And um, I... I went to the next verse, and I said, what? what? I, I never saw that before. What, what, did, what did that say? And I'm back to it, and this is what I saw. So this night belongs to him, and it must be commemorated every year. Temple or no temple, tabernacle or no tabernacle, nation or no nation. And here's the sad thing. It's only recorded in the promised land up until the time of one of the kings that they, they only celebrate one more time the following year. God did all of that. He brought the commemoration down of the ten plagues that he visited on the Egyptians and all the miracle signs and wonders he did for the Jews in the wilderness, he brought all of that down to one celebration every year, and they couldn't stick with it. I wanted to send an email to the theologian that said, all this proves our merit and shows why God chose us. I wanted to send an email and said, well, why, why didn't you keep it? And I've watched, this is 35 years in ministry for us, 30 of them leading churches. I've lost track of how many people have let go of the Lord. If you want to talk about work, if you want to do something, if you say, well, I, what, what can I do? I, Pastor, tell me what to do. You've got to maintain your awareness of the Lord Jesus Christ and your fellowship with him. If you want to think of this as a work, then think of that as a work. Jesus said when they asked him in John 6, what works must we do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, believe, trust, work to know, 
the one God has provided. And I'm paraphrasing. But, but he was saying, put all your focus there. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen? See, in the night, things can show up in ways that we don't experience them in the day. In the night, strange sounds are louder. In the night, the heaviness of darkness is weightier. In the night, the terror, the nightmares come. Nobody ever said to me, I have nightmares in the middle of the afternoon. But I've had hundreds, if not more, people say to me, Pastor, pray for me. I have nightmares in the night. And I want to tell you tonight, the Lord owns your night. If you'll hold on to him, he shed his blood. He hung on that cross. And if you'll keep those promises on the sides of your heart and on the top of your soul, I guarantee you that he will show you again and again and again, I own this night. It's not yours. I'll fight your battle. You don't have to. Be still in me and know that I am God. I am here for you, and I will not walk away from this battle. I'm the miracle-working God. You will not die, but you shall live. I will prosper you when no one else can. I have your back. That's the Lord we serve. Come on, stand with me this morning. Stand with me. I'm going to open this altar today. You can stay distanced. I've got my, my miracle working mask right here. This miracle working mask. I confess, I don't know how often it's been on my face. I don't know how. Many times I've shoved it in my pocket. I confess that I've probably breathed on both sides, but nevertheless, it's what's kept me, according to the state government, it has kept me absolutely perfect. <laughs> and you also know I won the lottery, right? I'm going to wear my mask. And I'm going to ask you to find a place. You may be closer than seven feet to somebody, but I don't care this morning. He owns our night. He owns the night of this pandemic, amen? Now, I don't think I'm going to lay hands on you, but I might. But if you're, if you're in the night, if you're in the night of betrayal, if you're in the night of brokenness, you're in the night of grieving, you're in the night of having a son or a daughter out in sin or in a horrible physical diagnosis with cancer or some blood disease, if you're in the night of financial ruin and your uh, check from the government didn't come yet and nobody's called to say you're the lottery winner, if you're in the night of embarrassment or shame, if you're in the night of your past, if you're in the night of hopelessness and despair, or you're in the night of not knowing, what God wants you to do the rest of this year or the rest of your life. I'm going to say to you this morning as I pray, I'm going to open this altar and I want us to come into it today after a year of not being to this altar. We're going to say, glory to God, we're coming by faith because you own the night. Hallelujah. You own this night. And you're going to do this as a declaration of your faith. I don't know what you're going through. You don't know what I'm going through. But you're going to Take the faith that you feel stirring inside of you today, and that's going to be your hyssop branch, and you're going to march down here and you're going to say, in the mighty name of Jesus, I'm applying the blood to my night, to my situation, to the doors, doorposts of my life. And God, you're going to bring me out. The Bible says on that very night, actually, it was the 430th night to the day. Now, there's no way they could have known that, but God did. God said, I've been counting. I was there with you when Abraham had to go and get Lot and his family back. I was counting. I was there when he interceded for Lot, begged me not to destroy Sodom until I got him out of there. I was there. I owned that night. When Isaac took the wood, arranged himself, climbed up on the altar, watched his father lift the knife over his throat. God said, I own that night. When Jacob was working year after year to pay for Rachel and Leah and to start a family, God said, I own that night. Whatever you're going through, he owns your night. 
As I pray, I want you to slip into this altar. We're going to take two minutes. I am right on time. We're going to take two minutes, and we're just going to say, God, you own my night. Father, as we pray today, I open this altar by faith. I open it under the word of the living God that this night belongs to you. Whatever my brothers and sisters, whatever my flock is going through, it belongs to you, and we thank God that he owns our night. Jesus. Come on, if, you've, if you're in a night right now, or if you've got people in your family that have been in the night, hallelujah. Doesn't it feel good? Doesn't it, hallelujah. Some of us said just on Wednesday night how good it felt just to come into the house of God. But we're, I've been telling you for weeks now, we're moving, easing back in to who we are as the people of God. I'm going to wait 15 more seconds if you're coming. Come on now. You don't have to be down front, but if you want to slide in, you can even stand in one of the aisles. But Okay, here's what I want you to say. I'm just going to do that statement with you. Lord Jesus, you own my night. Come on, let's say it again. I want to hear you say it out loud. Lord Jesus, you own my night. Lord Jesus, you own my night. Hallelujah. We give you praise today. We apply the blood in the mighty name of Jesus. We apply the blood. The blood is healing and deliverance. The blood is resurrection and power. The blood is victory. The blood is prosperity. The blood is an answer to our question, direction for the path of our lives. The blood gives us clear vision and the ability to hear. It's the blood that makes God's word active in our lives. It's the blood that gives us eternal life. It's the blood that brings us the promises, all of the promises that he's with us now and will come back for us soon. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you own my night. Oh, hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus, you own my night. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Worship him and tell him, Jesus, I know now how valuable it is to be in a relationship with you. Thank you for your peace that's flooding my soul right now. Thank you for the joy that's coming to me right now. Thank you for the power to come out of this thing now. Maybe, maybe next week, maybe next year, but you're going to bring me out with a mighty strong arm. Hallelujah. America, if you'll let it, this night belongs to the Lord Jesus. Thank you for joining us today by live stream. Those of you in the nations where we work, thank you so much. God bless you in Nicaragua, Pakistan, other nations. God bless you and thank you. If you'll trust him, if you'll hold on, you can go back to him day after day and say, Jesus, this night belongs to you. You're going to fight my battle, and you're going to deliver me. You're going to restore my health and bring back prosperity to my soul and life, and I worship you for it. Come on, let's take one moment this morning and just give him thanks. Thank you, Jesus, for owning my night. Thank you, Jesus, for restoring my confidence. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me hope. Thank you, Jesus, for directing my attention back to what you're doing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I want to close, but I can't. Somebody right now is just starting to break through here at the altar. You're just coming into that place where you feel something. You've been so discouraged for 10 months now, so uh, bound by this plague and so marginalized physically, not being able to be around. Let the Lord Jesus Christ come close to you now and hug you and hold you and remind you that he's had your night all along. He's had your night all along. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, we pray for the 11 o'clock service this morning. Sometimes it's a challenge for me to do the same message again, but God, there's something you're doing right now for us as a church. 
We felt it last Sunday. We felt it Wednesday night. There's something happening, Lord. And we're encouraged in the things of God. You own our night. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. You know, that's all you have to do is just say thank you. It might take you a half an hour or 45 minutes, but as you're thanking him, miracles are going to take place. Maybe not on a daily basis, but a miracle will come to your situation. Now, Father, you're the king. We thank you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Your Son and our sacrifice. Your Son and our soon coming Messiah. And we say thank you. Oh God, thank you. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Church, I love you this morning so very much. I just love you. I don't know how safe you feel, but if somebody moves towards you to hug you and you have the faith and the confidence, feel free to hug them back, okay? And, and you know, just love God. God will take care of it. But we, we've, got to, we've got to position ourselves to where he can do things in us and through us. This is his hour his day. God bless you. I will see you on Wednesday or on next Sunday as the Lord wills. Amen. Praise God.